This video is for A-level physics, looking at uh, firstly the keywords that we need to use when we're uh, analysing, evaluating and planning our practicals, uh, and then looking at uncertainty. So first of all, let's focus on errors. So in any experiment we do, typically we consider two different types of errors, systematic and random. Now if we start with random error, random error is usually caused by subtle fluctuations or variations in the environment, uh, and are often things that are ultimately just beyond our control. Uh, random error produces small amounts of scatter on a graph. So for example, if I just talk about reliability for a second, Basically, the only time we really comment on reliability in an experiment is we talk about the scatter of a particular graph. So if I have a graph, uh, and I'm going to say that my line of best fit is a beautiful straight line, and I have points that look like that, then I would say that this graph or this results are reliable because the scatter either side of the line of best fit is very, very small, very minimal. So these small variations, you can see that's just a little bit away from the line of best fit there, and that one's a little bit higher. Those small variations are due to random error. Now, systematic error happen um, as a result of either the method that we're using uh, or because of the limitations within our equipment. So it's always limitations in one of these two areas, equipment or method, that causes systematic error. One specific example of systematic error uh, that is, in terms of our equipment, might be a zero error. Okay, so for example, if I've got an ammeter or voltmeter that's calibrated incorrectly, and again, calibration is a key word that we need to use when we're talking about these, these words. Um, if it's calibrated incorrectly so that when it should say zero, it doesn't, maybe it says 0 0.1 volts, for example, then obviously that error is going to carry through into every reading that I then take for the rest of my experiment. So it's important that, um, that I calibrate my equipment accurately. Issues around the method that are going to cause some more, more errors um, often can only be avoided by changing the method or changing the equipment that we're using to collect the data. So, for example, if I record a time with a stopwatch, um, that equipment has a fundamental limitation, uh, which if I was to improve my method by using, say, a light gate, for example, would be improved. Now. Talking about different types of equipment, this is where precision comes in. So precision is how closely grouped together my actual results are. So if we compare precision and accuracy for a second, we usually do that by thinking about darts, because it's a nice, easy way of visualizing it. And we think about that I'm aiming for the bullseye. That's where I'm aiming for. So imagine I threw three darts, and what I managed to get was this. This is where they landed. Now, if you look at that, these three darts that I've thrown have not been accurate because I was aiming for the bullseye. But I have been precise because every time I keep getting my uh, darts in a very similar position. So clearly, there is something in the method that I'm using when my technique, when I'm throwing my darts, that is making them all go slightly to the right. Uh, that some is some systematic error in my technique that I am that, that sort of causes the, the result to be inaccurate. So this would not be accurate, but it would be precise. So accuracy is how close a value is to its true value, and precision is how closely grouped together they are. Precision is intrinsically linked to resolution, which is the smallest value that a uh, piece of equipment can measure. So for example, I could use a ruler which has maybe a precision, uh, a resolution of plus or minus one millimeter. That might be the best that it could do. But equally, I could use, say, um, a caliper uh, and I could then get a improvement in my um, resolution, which might be 0 0.01 millimeters. I could have a similar thing for, say, a stop clock. So a stop clock might have uh, a might 
might have a resolution of plus or minus uh, 0 0.01 seconds, okay? Um, but usually the issue with a stopwatch is that although the piece of equipment can measure to uh, a hundredth of a second, I can't. So it is my then my reaction time that then limits this piece of equipment. And so actually, despite the resolution being this, probably my uncertainty, my absolute uncertainty for this method, maybe would be like half a second if I was being lucky. So the resolution is not always the same as my 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 absolute uncertainty. Uh, sometimes the method will influence that in another way. Whereas if I was to use a light gate, I could probably get to this value quite easily there's no issue of reaction time, so I could measure to this level of precision. So resolution is the smallest um, integer or smallest unit that a specific piece of equipment is capable of measuring. Now, I just want to mention accuracy in terms of how we quantify it uh, a little bit more. So for example, if we are doing an experiment to determine g, which is acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.81 meters seconds to the minus one. If I was doing that experiment, and that's that's what I know the true value of g is, but when I did it, I got a value, for example, of 10.2 as an example. But it's important that when I ever state always and whenever I state a value, I always need to state my uncertainty. So uh, absolute uncertainty is how much above or below this value we are uncertain about our results. So let's just say for argument's sake that I am plus or minus 0 0.5 meters seconds to the minus 2. That's my absolute uncertainty. Now what I use this absolute uncertainty for is I can work out my percentage uncertainty and I can also work out my percentage difference. So let's just have a look at how we would do that. So if I wanted to work out my percentage uncertainty in G based upon this data here, what I would do is I would do my absolute uncertainty, which is the plus or minus bit that follows it. So we call this the absolute uncertainty because it's a specific number. And so I would do 0 0.5 divided by 10.2 times 100. In other words, I'm trying to find out what percentage of this number is 0 0.5. So if we then do that in our calculator, 0 0.5 divided by 10.2 times 100, we would get that is equal to 4.9%. So that's my percentage uncertainty, okay? So I have my absolute uncertainty, I also have my percentage uncertainty, and we use them in different ways, as we'll see. Now, the other thing I can do is, this is my true value of G, and this is my calculated or theoretical value, uh, sorry, my, my measured value of G. And obviously, those two things are different. So the other thing we can do besides percentage uncertainty is that we can do percentage difference. So percentage difference is about comparing true values to calculated ones. And we can use this to then assess accuracy. So percentage difference, what I would do is I have to do my true uh, value minus my calculated or my measured value divided by my true value times 100. Okay. Now, you'll notice I've put these lines here and here uh, at the end of um, this the numerator. What those lines represent is what we call the modulus. In other words, the modulus just means that this number at the top can never be a negative. It's always going to be a positive. So true value minus calculated value, if if the calculated value uh, was larger, like it is in this case, I can't get a minus answer. So effectively, a modulus just means the answer to this is always the difference between them 
and it's always a positive number. So as an example, um, I'm just going to make the maths nice and easy. I'm going to do this the other way around just so that it comes out. So 10.2 minus 9.81 divided by 9.81 times 100. So that's the calculation I'm going to do. So let's do that on the calculator. So 10.2 minus 9.81. That gives me a difference of 0 0.39. Now, if I did it the other way around, 9.81 minus 10.2, then I obviously get minus 0 0.39. I just ignore the minus, which I can get rid of by doing that answer. So then I get my number. So it, you can't have a minus answer for that top part. So it's just the difference between them. And then divide that by the true value times 100. And then we get a percentage difference of 3.98%. Uh, okay, approximately 4%. Now, this is where we can finally assess whether we've been accurate or not. If we compare the percentage uncertainty and the percentage difference for this particular experiment, we can make a judgment on whether I've been accurate or not. Now, I have worked out that my percentage difference is 3.9 for basically 4%, but my uncertainty is 4.9%. Now that means I've measured, and if I do this as a number line, it will help. So 10.2, and I know that my value based on my uncertainty could be as much as 10.7, or it could be as low as going the other way, minus 0.5, uh, 9.7. So that's my my percentage uncertainty is 4.9% plus or minus either way of that number. Now the true value would sit about here, 9.81. Okay. Now the true value is within my percentage uncertainty. So in other words, my the result that I have, give, given my uncertainty, has produced within it a range within that range of numbers the potential for the number that is the true value. In other words, my experiment has been accurate because my percentage difference is smaller than my percentage uncertainty. Now, if my percentage uncertainty was larger, uh, well, sorry, it was smaller than my percentage difference, what that would mean is that maybe my number line said that this was what my range of values would be, but maybe the true answer was over here. So it isn't within the uncertainty and my value for my experiment, so therefore it's inaccurate. So the rule is, with accuracy, if your percentage uncertainty is larger than your percentage difference, or your percentage difference is smaller, or if you want to think about it, then it is accurate. So this experiment has been accurate. But if my percentage uncertainty was smaller, than my percentage difference, then that means I have not been accurate. So we have these keywords that we talk about in experiments, errors, precision, which is linked to resolution, accuracy, which we link to both percentage uncertainty and percentage difference, and reliability, which we link to the scatter of a graph. And just to be sort of as a final point, with reliability, we can see here there is very little scatter, which means it is reliable, and that means that we only have some random error. If we had a more systematic error that was causing a larger potential different percentage difference, what could happen, for example, is that all of the points on my graph could be raised by some amount. This is because of my method pushing my values in one particular direction. So therefore, if I did my line of best fit, you can see my gradient still very similar. Uh, however, um, you can see that all the values are too high, and hence this is not accurate because there would be some systematic error.